Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 372 for Monday, February 6th, 2023. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in no longer frozen, no longer Hoth world, Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, Dave. Hey, Paul. All right. So I, I'm sure we've got, you know, at least 15 listeners all over the world who are dying to know what happened when you showed up for the gig? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you dropped the first f bomb in in um, show history. Gig Gab history. That's yeah, right. yeah. So we deserve we deserve to get the the rest of the story now. Yeah. So uh, the I never heard from uh, the the one we have we had one contact uh, uh, for the uh, for the the headliner band that that played yesterday uh, Sunday at the Midway Cafe, I, and I have more to talk about with this gig. Cause it was a fantastic gig and really a great club. Uh, but I never did hear back from them. And, uh, I, I decided to, uh, and, and mostly followed your no drama, the day of the gig thing. So earlier in the week, we and fling decided, look, you know, we're slipping all the way down to Boston. Uh, we're not going to very, make very much money. We should carpool. So, if there is no drum set to for us to use, we're not going to bring our own uh, because that limits our ability to carpool. And so uh, we decided, let's just do it acoustic. Fling works really well acoustic. There's no issue with that. It lets us all be upstanding uh, because we are upstanding people. And uh, and it you know it allows the the harmonies to sort of shine through and the the song power to to be there. So it was like, yeah, this is. There's no reason to worry about this. Like, this is a fantastic option. So I think Tuesday or Wednesday, we just chose that. It was like, okay, no matter what happens, this is what we're going to do. And everybody could just sort of set their minds to it. And, and so that's what we did. And uh, never heard from the headliner. They, they showed up, I think, after the event had started. It was a four-band thing. Uh, and we were third. And uh, – the only I I opted not to like ask the guy, hey, you know, what's up, dude? But uh, while I was introducing the band from the stage mid set, uh, I I said, and I'm Dave and I do a bunch of podcasts, one for musicians, one for tech support. So if there's anybody out there that needs some help like you, sir, <laughs> who needs some help with their Gmail, I would be the guy you talk to. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then after I said that, you know, Mike started the next song and Russ turned to me. He's like, you feel better now? I'm like, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> <laughs> I did two podcasts. Yeah. One where we talk about when mus other musicians are not cool and two where we offer <laughs> tech support for when they're not cool because they can't work their freaking email. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Love it. Yeah. All right. A little, a little vengeance. No, it was, it made me feel better. It was for me. And, uh, our, I don't think uh, Jamie, our bass player, didn't. Uh, he didn't quite catch the reference uh, in the, the like in the gig, but we were talking afterwards because we stayed around to to watch them because uh, it's the polite thing to do, and also it was you know sort of the the agreement for uh, us to get paid our fifty five dollars for the uh, for the day, which is what everybody got. So I don't, like th there's a whole conversation we had about those kinds of gigs they, they they charge five bucks at the door they should have charged 15 i think I, and i don't think it would have made a difference but um what a great club this uh, it was the midway cafe in boston i'd heard about this place i'd never been there i went expecting it to be like the traditional grungy boston rock club um and it was it was it was a dive bar for sure but it it was like a dive bar with a little bit of with a lot more personality than I ex than I expected. It reminded me of like dive bars in Austin, not dive bars in Boston. For some reason, I don't know. It just had like a a real music vibe, and and the the bartender was great. He, I wound up ch chatting with him. He was clearly a huge music fan. He was like, "Thank you so much for you know coming down from the seacoast of New Hampshire. You know, like th this is great that that you guys would would come here." And, 
Uh, he's like, I'm glad there's some people in the room because, you know, it's, it would, would be terrible if you play to play to, you know, nobody or just the other bands or whatever. And um, but clearly like live music fans and live music focused. We had a fantastic moment of synchronicity and serendipity. Uh, after we played one of our fling songs, we played all originals for the, the 45 minute set that we did. We played Kicked in the Nuts, which is uh, on our, I believe was on our first EP called Bovine Abduction. And I, th I think that was on the first one. It's on one of them. Uh, Flingrocks.com is where you can go find all that stuff, including our new EP, Uncorked. Uh, so you can get yourself uncorked at Flingrocks.com. But uh, we played, we finished Kicked in the Nuts and... It's a it, it it's a sort of a peppy you know rocker kind of tune and it ends with a tight sounds like a ballad to me. Well, we started it as a ballad. When we do it acoustic, <laughs> we do we do start it as a ballad. Well, it's, good to good to hear. It's true, but and then and then we we shift it into to high gear uh, to to ride it out, and it ends with a with a tight little ending. And as soon as we ended it, our keyboard player Aaron said, "And it hurts." Because for whatever reason, it reminded him of the, uh, the, the where, when the knack said, and it hurts in the middle of good girls don't. And, and that's all he said, right? He said, and it hurts. And I turned to him and laughed and because, you know, I, I caught the reference immediately. We yeah. used to play that song a bunch. You and I played that song in the Macworld All Stars. Yeah. Fun band, fun, uh, fun band, fun song. And uh, so that, that was maybe four songs into our set, whatever. We played, you know, 12 songs or something like that. And we finished our last song, said goodnight. And the house music comes on and it's good girls don't. And uh, Aaron and I turned to each other and we were like, there's no way that this is intentional. It's just got to be a coincidence. There's no way somebody else heard that reference. Cause it, we didn't dig into it. It was, it was three words. That was it. And uh, later in the, the night, you know, I was talking to the bartender about music and I'm like, by the way, was that you? He's like, obviously I'm like, dude, <laughs> dude, thank you. I'm like, he's like, we're paying attention here. He's like, don't think that anything gets by us. I'm like, well, that's that, that mad props to, uh, to the staff at the Midway cafe. That was, that was a, a really fun place to play. I hope to get back there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it, it, the gig worked out well. Fling played well. It was, uh, ben. yeah, we, we, it was, it was, yeah, it was great. And I, and you know, I got to have my, uh, my moment of snarkiness that, that, that was only, was only received by people who would get it in a positive way. Like the, the guy who, the guy who, you know, who it was aimed at was not even paying attention. Like, you know, cause I pointed right at him. It was like, Oh, for example, you, sir. And he was you know, clueless about it, which is, which is best. It's fine. Like he doesn't, you know, whatever. He should check his email though. I am happy to help him. So <laughs> there, um, there was the, the band before us was called. We all as one word will, uh, as the second word. Now, Will was the bass player in this trio. There was a drummer and a guitar player. And as a as an aside, the guitar player, this woman Julie, had one it, like her sense of her sound and her volume and her blend on stage was like I've I, I it was impressive. She really knew how to make sure she wasn't like overpowering, but still cutting through and all. It was just, I watched her while she was singing a song, like adjusting the volume of her guitar to make sure that it was like blending and like right in the moment. It was really impressive uh, to see somebody with, you know, that kind of stage awareness. I, I think we can, mm. we can all aspire to always be paying attention to that kind of thing. And, and she really, she, it was just super impressive and she got a great what type of music. They, so that's why I wanted to bring them up. I was talking to them before and, and they told me about their kind of music and then they delivered on it. They're like, no, we're a cover band. I was like, what are you doing on a bill with all original bands? And they're like, well, we play covers that are obscure and we want to be the one to introduce you to these songs. So a lot of people think our songs are originals. And it's like, you guys are the vanity cover band project. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Will, who, who was telling us this, uh, was saying, yeah, you know, I've been doing this a long time. He's like, I just want to play the music I want to play. And uh, I want to play the music that means something to me. And so I'm happy to do it this way. And it's like, OK, it sounds great. You know, yeah. But do do 
you know, we've had these conversations about how cover bands are often put in a much different basket than original bands. So I, I wonder if that approach, I wonder if he explains who they are when, when he ch- goes out trying to get gigs. I think he does. Go to original, original music. Well, that's, that's kind of weird. I mean, I guess you're saying I'm not paying the normal cover band dance stuff. Yes. So we're, we're as good to you as a, as a, as a, Original band. As an original band. We're, we're going to be entertaining. We're going to play. I thought, I thought people who are into original music are kind of purists about creating original art. And that's what the flaw is with that approach. I mean, I, I get wanting to play what you want to play. Yeah. But do you often make yourself not, not palatable to cover band clubs who want the usual stuff or to original who want pure original music? Have, have, you, have you really kind of cut your, 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 your list of possible venues way down? Yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree. I'd never, this is at least in, in my experience, unique. I'd never run into a band like this. And I'm, I'm looking on their website right now at we all dash will.com. We all will brings covers of not exactly familiar tunes right to your auditory cortex. So. I, and we're, and you're saying this is the band that had the, the singer who had this great stage awareness, sound awareness. Yeah. All three of them sang. The, the, the Will sang, Julie, the guitar player sang, and, and Olaf, the drummer, sang. So, yeah, they, um, they, they, they I, so, so just take yourself out of having met them and, you know, yeah. I, I mean, just as a, just as an approach, like even that tagline, we play the covers that you don't know. Basically, yes. Who does that appeal to? I, I, I don't, well, I don't know. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to this. It's, I'm not the one marketing them. I just found it fascinating. And it, you know, like I said, it made sense that they were on a bill with original bands. Cause I mean, there were, there were some tunes they played that I recognized. Like, of course, none of them come to mind right now because I'm, uh, you know, under pressure here, Paul, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, you know, it wasn't, I mean, they certainly weren't playing Mustang Sally in sweet home, Alabama and, and, and those sorts of things. They did do, a cover of Louie Louie. They covered Iggy's rendition of Louie Louie. Uh, but that certainly was the, the, the most recognizable of their songs, like by far. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah. like they, they were entertaining. I mean, you know, on stage. Each, yeah. It's each his own. I, yeah. And I actually, I could see that that would work. And actually, I think I told you when I started my group, I was playing what I wanted to play. Yeah with the attitude that good songs played well should go over anywhere. Right. And I was somewhat beaten to submission over time <laughs> that, the, that the path to getting gigs in cover band clubs is to play, you know, what people know and want to dance to so yeah. regardless of how good you are. Right. And, and uh, just really found that that would be a hard, a hard road to go down is just, you know, and I, I, I would have thought, listen, I, I would enjoy a good polka band, a good any band, you know, if they're fun and, you know, they're entertaining. That would be fun to me, it, the actual songs themselves. But, you know, over and over. And, you know, our, our, buddy, our buddy Adam at Cover Band Confidential just did this, this uh, video about, you know, five steps. And one of them is, you know, play what your audience wants to hear. Sure. So, so uh, you know, again, there's not one perfect thing and you know if this guy's a good marketer and if he can talk his way into you know giving a proposition why original music clubs you know would it would benefit from this or you know or if they're that good that they they can do all the more power to them just seems like a a hard road maybe it may be a very rewarding road to go yeah i mean he it, it sounds like they've been doing this long enough that they certainly have been tempted they they have the, the the temptation of just playing covers that everybody else knows is not something that's going to impact them at, at all. Um, yeah. 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 They play what they want. It's fun. Well, you know? Yeah, I know. To yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the guy that opened up the night, Larry Newman, uh, well, I should, I, I should mention the headliners that it, it was Martin Morell and Fredette, um, Fredette, they, all three of them, were at one point in time in the eighties or nineties separately in fairly popular Boston bands. Uh, And it was an interesting lineup. 
David Fredette and Eric Martin both play guitar. And not that Eric Martin. That Eric Martin? Not from the, the which Eric Martin are you thinking of? Mr. Mr. Big, Eric Martin. No, not from Mr. Big. Uh, but he was in, I don't think he, I don't think this is the Eric Martin from Mr. Big. I, 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 no, I forget the names of the bands that he was in, but, but he, he was in quite a few sort of, um, alternative style bands that, that had their day in, in as like Boston staples back in the you know late eighties to early nineties. Uh, the drummer, uh, Steve Morell, I want to say was the drummer for the Del Fuegos and, mm. Yeah, and then um, David Fredette was, uh, I believe he played guitar in The Upper Crust. And I think they even played on Letterman. They were uh, a band that would dress in like, you know, powdered wigs and and stuff. They they, they kind of had a thing for a little while. But um, their lineup was, was in, it was two guitars and drums. There was no bass player. And... Um, uh, one of the guitar players played rhythm with a, with a lot of sort of, you know, the, without the low end rolled out of his amp. And then the other one was playing leads and some rhythms, but also using uh, some keyboard style patches to really kind of layer in the sounds. They had a cool, a cool vibe. Um, it was, and it, so, you know, it was, it was fine. It was cool. The, um, the opener was this solo guitar player uh acoustic guitar player named larry newman actually f from up here he's from further away than we are he was from kittery maine just o over the border and uh he, he played his all his own songs sort of bluesy uh originals with 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 great little hooks and and funny lyrics or uh, clever lyrics i'll say uh, it wasn't a comedy show by any stretch but after the gig, he was telling me this story, Paul. I, I, I'm going to reach out to him and see, because it seemed like he had a lot of stories. But he was telling me the story. He used to live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and had a gig, this you know, decades ago, opening up for Chuck Berry. And so he and his band, you know, got there to the, like, it was like the big club in town or whatever. They got there early to make sure that they could, like, you know, get their stuff set up and, and then out of the way so that when Chuck and his band arrived, they would, you know, they'd be able to do what they were going to do. And Chuck walks in and looks at the manager or whatever and says, where's my band? And the manager has kind of a panicked moment and turns to Larry and his band and says, hey, you guys want to be Chuck Berry's band for the night? <laughs> and... And they said, sure. And so he said there were no charts or anything. He said most of the time uh, they didn't even know what key the song was in. They had to kind of hear it and and figure it out. So it really was that that, you know, that back to the future moment of uh, of of, you know, hear the changes, try to keep up. Right. Follow the changes, try to keep up. And uh, after the gig, Chuck said to him, hey, I got like seven more dates uh, kind of, you know, in and around this area over the next couple of weeks, you guys want to do them with me? And so he did the, those dates with him, but uh, what a, what a crazy little, you know, that's rock and roll cool man. story. Yeah. yeah. That's a cool story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's stories out there, uh, uh, you know, about Chuck Berry kind of walking in and, you know, whoever is the local promoter, put it together, a backup band. He comes in at the last minute, does his gig, you know, gets his money and goes out. And gets his money. Like, yeah. Got his money. His, yeah. And this was Larry said that this was at a time where um, the the tax man was was following Chuck Berry around. It was like, but but right before they had arrested him for owing like I don't know tax evasion on like ninety five thousand dollars or something. Uh, but yeah, craziness, craziness. Uh, Eric Martin played in a band called the Neats. I just found it as I was like adding things to the show notes here. That, that would was, definitely be different than Mr. Big. I think so. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's the same one. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, one thing I noticed, and the only reason I noticed it, Paul, when I walked into the Midway is because it also was the case at the, um, uh, the, the, the old rail pizza where I played last Sunday with monkey fist two gigs in a row where clubs had signs on the doors that said, we are now cash only. 
Are you seeing that at all out there? Nope. Quite the opposite. We're seeing yeah, no cash. Right. <laughs> I mean, I with 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 COVID and everything, I expected cash was just going to go away for the most part. Uh, you know, I mean, it'd still be legal tender and all that. But in terms of practical, functional use in society, I kind of like it's sort of gone everywhere else. And so like when I when I, when I got to Old Rail last weekend, I knew Lisa was coming. And I texted her. I'm like, hey, just FYI, it's cash only, but they do have an ATM here. And and uh, basically sent her the same text because she and and uh, uh, Russ's wife, Lynette, uh, came down to Boston. And I texted her. I'm like, hey, FYI, it's the same thing. It's just bizarre to me. The cash only. I, it just doesn't. I, 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 I Now I want to know why this is happening. If everybody knows, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to uh, love to hear from you. But yeah, I don't I don't know where that um where that came from, man. Uh, yes. Yeah. Bizarre. The outlier. It's the outlier. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess, you know, you can have two outliers in a row. So, <laughs> um, you got anything you, you, I have more, but, but like I'm, I've been sort of dominating the agenda here. Do you have anything? No, I was off last weekend and yep. coming up, I've got a good four in a row coming this weekend, which is fun. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, you know, just talking about singing chops, I am like a religious nut about warming up now. Like I've got, you know, a, a warm up routine, and it, it, and but I can do these acoustic gigs. I can pretty much do them every day. I mean, that's great. And it's funny how once I plug in, I really have to be vigilant about technique. Otherwise, I will fall back into bad habits mm. and and have a hard time getting through a gig or getting to the next one. But yeah, yeah. I can do. Two, three hours, you know, four or five days in a row and, and never have a problem, but one acoustic gig. And if I'm not in my head, you know, reminding myself, breathe, you know, diaphragm, don't over sing, you know, don't, don't squeeze, don't push, you know, I can, I can blow myself out if I'm not, if I'm not conscious of it. And I Interesting. think it's, I don't know whether it's the energy or what it is. Again, not a trained singer. I have to focus and concentrate to sing. So, um, but yeah, we'll see. Interesting. But, uh, it, the one thing I, I I am looking forward to this weekend is probably the most because I haven't seen I haven't been up to play in the Bay Area in a month. Right. And so with the House Rockers, we have a her, a rehearsal and a gig, and we have a, a a fairly good stack of stuff that we agreed to learn in the rehearsal. That the goal is it's one rehearsal and we have to be able to play it the you know that following weekend. Yeah. And then the band I play with on the Friday night, my coffee shop band, they uh, same thing. We've got three new songs. So I actually have quite a bit of new material that I'm spending time this week. I mean, I've been learning it and I kind of know it and now I'm really trying to, you know, get it down, but it is fun to have that much new material to look forward to in, in both groups. Um, I think I've told you this. I have musical ADD really bad. Oh, same. I will have, I, I have like 20 acoustic solo songs at any one time that I'm, that I, I I'm 70% good with. Yep. And then I see a rabbit and I go chase the rabbit and I don't, you know, get to a hundred percent locked and loaded now, to get it into my show to get the repetition. To I was going to say, does in, in your, in, in, in those definitions, a hundred percent in your definition is, is show ready. Anything less than that you wouldn't put in the show. Is that right? Um, you know, maybe at 90 percent were and to me, what 90 percent would be is that I'm, I'm referencing an iPad for a reminder of lyrics usually sure. changes are you know not that not that hard for me to retain. Okay. But um but a lyric here or a lyric there and once it's in my head that I might not know the lyrics, that's kind of the kiss of death yeah. that, that I will definitely not even if I do know the lyrics, right? Oh no. So to me, if you, yeah, if you if you if you get in your head about that, I mean that it doesn't matter how long I've been singing a song, if I convince myself that I don't know it right before I'm supposed to sing it, I'm screwed. Uh, it's, yeah. it's over. It's exactly that's exactly it. So to yeah. me, the best songs are the ones that I have so much comfort with. I don't think about anything except performing them. And I and the n number of times I I finish a song to that degree in my bedroom before I perform it is not nearly often enough because of this musical ADD. And like sure. I said, right now, you know, I was on a path with a plan. And then, oh, that would be a cool, oh, that would be a cool, oh, that would be a cool one. Yeah. And so then then you have 20 songs that you're, you know, anywhere from, you know, 50 to 70% done with, but not 100% done with. And uh, 
I don't know. You know, that I guess that's one of the things. All the times when we talk about what's a professional, I would say ability to focus and, you know, complete a task would be a, a trait of a professional. Sure. Or at least make it seem like you have. Well, and, you know, if, you're good, enough, deliver, if you're good yeah. enough to fake it, that would be, you know, good for you. Yeah. But for, for most of us, you know, literally getting the nuances of a song to be able to emote it effectively yep. is, is, and be able to finish it without, you know, it's like anything. If, if, if you know, you're, if you're a professional, you, you, you do the job, not, not do the job well enough to plausibly deniably say you did the job, right? but you know, really do the job. We, we, um, we, we had a uptown celebration rehearsal this weekend and it, it was also an audition. We rehearsed for a few hours and then Gary had, I think three couples come in that are, you know, considering uh, booking the band, uh, you know, at some point later this year or whatever. And, and, um, we were all talking afterwards because there were maybe half the songs that we played for the audition were songs that we already knew. And then there, the other half were songs that were new to us as of, of Saturday, right. When, when we got together and, uh, it was, it, it was amazing. A ba the bass player also named Dave and I were talking after rehearsal and it was like, you know, he was like, gosh, you know, we're, we're playing these tunes even the first time through in rehearsal. He's like, I'm always so impressed that like, you know, the, the songs I'm like, well, of course I know the songs. <laughs> like, so do you, right? Like, and, and we had that conversation about, you know, like you and I had about how everybody in, in a band, not everybody, oftentimes in a band, the amount of prep work that is, ex that everyone puts in is a little more than you expect the the guy who's going to do the least to do, right? So you're not going to be the lowest, you know, the weak link in the chain, but you're not going to be too much stronger than that. And in in this band, that may be true, but I can't tell you who the weak link is. Everybody just knew their parts and knew the songs and played them down cold. Like it like we could have played any of those songs on stage for the first time and it would have been totally fine. Uh, you know, we knew the version that we were playing. We had via email or Slack or whatever. Thank goodness that band's on Slack now. Um, you know, we we converted, you know, conversed about like endings and that sort of thing. And it was just like, well, yeah, should we play it? And there was one tune alone by heart. And we had like five minutes before we needed to rap before the audition started. And I was like, let's just run it and see what happens. And we nailed it, including all the harmonies and everything. Cause I love singing those, you know, you know, ah! You know, that the it's, it works out great. And the band just nailed it. And uh I was like, wow, that's it. Like song's ready to go. It's good to go. Um and and then we wound up adding it to the audition list, which it wasn't on because it was, you know, Ooh. yeah. So but it, it's it, it's it, it's a pleasure to be in a project where that happens. Obviously, in an original project, that's uh, like you wouldn't really want that goes. to happen. Yeah, you kind of want that collaborative process, but Somebody else wrote the song and arranged the song, man. Just show up and play it. It's fine. So, ah, you got anything else, man? No, short week. Like I said, I've got four in a row, so I'll have some good stuff next time yeah. we get together. But, uh, you know, I loved hearing the story about about how you that one gig, you know, that I've been waiting all week to ask. I know. That, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I posted a picture and. Uh, one of our listeners, Chip, immediately commented. He's like, oh, no drum set. He's like, is this the gig? I'm like, yeah, this is the gig. Yeah. <laughs> but it works and out. We, Fling works out great that way. I, it's no problem. Well, you're lucky at that. We have to have a, a virtual swear jar somewhere. We do. That's true. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it's it's not just so easy as flipping the, uh, the explicit tag in iTunes mm -hmm. and letting it happen. Or right. maybe it is. I don't know. All good, man. All good. Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for putting always up with my potty mouth last week. Yes, always be performing. Even when you got a potty mouth. That's especially. <laughs> Feedback at giggabpodcast.com, folks. We'll see you next week. Late. <laughs> <laughs>